Hello everyone. Today I will talk about multi-party reusable non-interactive secure computation from LWE. My name is Ilan Komargotsky and this is based on joint work with Fabrice Benhamuda, Ayush Jain and Rachel Lin. The motivating scenario for the talk is the following setting. Imagine four parties, one, two, three, and four, that each of them has a private input or private database, a x1, x2, x3, and x4, and they want to be able to perform joint computations on their input, and they want to make sure that the computations are private. So for instance, party one, two, and three can come together and decide that they want to perform some study on their joint inputs and learn some function f on their respective inputs. And we can imagine that this is done by a, a single message that is being sent from each of the parties to the public evaluator. You can think of these, fun as, of these messages as some, as some magical encoding of the database. And the encoding should not reveal any information beyond the output of the function that we want to compute. And at some later stage, we, we may, it may happen that some other subset of parties want to perform another computation on their joint inputs. And maybe even at a later stage, new parties join the game and they now want to compute something together with some other party. So we want to support this complicated scenario and allow every subset of parties to perform computation on their joint inputs. And we want to allow parties to join at any point in time. So this sounds like a great thing, but the problem is that even if we think about the simplest setting where there's only three parties and they're fixed, and each of them wants to send just one message alpha to the evaluator, then it's already pretty well known that it's impossible to achieve the standard definition of security where only the output of the function on the respective inputs is leaked. Because imagine that one party is malicious and it colludes with the evaluator, then this party can imagine in its head that its input was something else, some x1 prime. And then if this was its input to begin with, then given the two messages of the other parties, it could have learned the value of the function f on a new set of inputs, which includes the new input that it imagined, x1 prime. So this is clearly not something that we want to have, and therefore we need to somehow add something more to the protocol in order to be able to guarantee security. And the solution is actually not that complicated. The minimal thing that is uh, required is to somehow force each party to commit on its input before the beginning of the evaluation. And intuitively, this should, have, this should prevent parties from imagining that their input was something else and thereby learn the value of some function on a new input. So imagine that each party would, before it starts to evaluate functions on, its, uh, on their respective inputs, each party publishes on a public bulletin board some encoding of its input. Think of it as a cryptographic commitment, some hiding commitment. Okay, so this commitment, commitment is already published in the sky, and each party can remember for itself some secret that's associated with this commitment. And now uh, these messages that are sent to the public evaluator can be generated as functions of those encodings that are already written to the public bulletin board. And this completely prevents uh, an adversary from imagining that the input was something else. Now with those public commitments in the sky, you can imagine that uh, more parties will can join the protocol, even after some of the evaluations uh, had already occurred. Uh, and this party can commit on its own input publish it on the public bulletin board. And at that point, it can readily start performing computations with any of the existing parties. So this is in a, in a very high level how multi-party reusable non-interactive secure computation works, which we'll call shortly MRNISP. Slightly more formally, an MRNISP protocol will consist of three phases two of which are going to be phases where a message is outputted and the last phase is 
uh, is just a computation phase. So the first phase, each party will commit on its input. The commitment will output a public commitment that is going to be written to the public bulletin board. And it will also output some secret state that is going to be used in the later computation phase. In the computation phase, uh, the, a subset of parties is given a function f that they want to compute on their joint inputs. The computation phase of each party will take as input the function, the commitments on the inputs of all of the other parties, and also its, secret, its own secret state. This phase will output some public computation message. And then, then there will be a public function, public evaluation function, that will generate the output of the, fun of the function that we want to compute. This public evaluation function will not use any of the secrets of the party because it's, it can be made completely publicly. So it will only use the public commitments and the messages, the computation messages that were sent by each party. And importantly, we want correctness even for parties that join throughout the game, even after some of the parties may have already performed uh, several computation phases. And therefore, we also want the input encoding to be independent of the set of parties that exist in the system. For security, we will consider a standard notion of security, of simulation security. For simplicity, you should imagine a semi-honest adversary, but our results will apply even for semi-malicious adversaries. We will consider static corruptions, namely the adversary commits on the set of corrupted parties ahead of time. And we are in the setting of dishonest majority. In, in other words, uh, it may be a little bit more convenient to just think of MRNIST as a special type of two-round MPC where the first message of each party is reusable, namely it can be reused with multiple round two messages. And also the set of parties is completely dynamic, namely the first round message doesn't depend on the number of parties, their identities or anything like that. What do we know about this problem? So we have a handful of results from various assumptions and various uh, properties. The very early constructions of two round MPC protocols actually can actually be shown to satisfy the general structure of or the general properties of MRNIST. Uh, but the problem is that they relied on somewhat strong assumptions like IO and witness encryption which we know how to instantiate based on well-founded assumptions, but still they are highly inefficient and still rely on a collection of uh, assumptions. More modern two-round MPC protocols, uh, for instance, those based on uh, multi-key FHE or homomorphic secret sharing, they, they don't support a dynamic set of parties and therefore uh, they do not implement an MRNIST. The notion of MRNIST was brought into spotlight about a year and a half ago by Ben Hamouda and Lin, who showed the first construction from a single standard assumption, and they did it from SXDH. And in this work and the uh, concurrent work by Anand Tal that you're going to hear about next, uh, we achieved an MRNIST from LWE. Technically, what we do is we identify a complete functionality for MRNIST, and we show how to implement it uh, by using LWE. Namely, we identify a primitive called reusable functional OT, which is a, a very specific form of MRNIST. We show how to bootstrap this specific form of MRNIST to full-fledged MRNIST. And we also show how to build this specific protocol, specific functionality from LWE. And as an application, we observe that you can use an MRNISC to basically thresholdize every multi-key FHE by using an MRNISC to implement the threshold decryption phase. And as an application, we obtain a construction of threshold multi-key FHE scheme with better parameters than what was previously known, or better assumptions than, were, than what was previously known. So, in order to overview the construction, let me tell you a little bit of, about how previous constructions worked and what they needed to assume. So the first two-round MPC construction 
was based on obfuscation or indistinguishability obfuscation. And then people observed that you don't really need the full, full power of obfuscation. You need something much weaker. Uh, you need garbled circuits and some, so, some form of witness encryption. So Gargit Al protocol from 2015 used the uh, witness encryption for NP. And the more recent work of Ben Hamoud and Lin, they observed that you, that you only need witness encryption for a particular language. And they were able to implement this witness encryption scheme from a standard assumption. And in this work, we relaxed the additional assumption on the garbled circuits uh, even further. And we showed that you don't really need a full-fledged witness encryption, but you can actually work with a seemingly weaker primitive uh, that we call reusable functional OT. And we implement it using LW. Let's explain a little bit better how IO or witness encryption are used to get a two round MPC. The main idea in most of these works is to take a, a general MPC protocol that could have L rounds, where L is bigger than two, and compress it to just two rounds with the following recipe. In the first round, you just commit your inputs with some commitment. And in the second round, instead of uh, running the second round of the original protocol, you obfuscate a circuit that essentially simulates what every party would have done in the previous protocol. Namely, you obfuscate a circuit that gets all of the previous messages uh, that uh, were sent in the protocol and it generates the next message that the party would have generated if it had seen the, these messages in the protocol. And GLS 15, uh, notice that you don't really need the full power of IO. You can just garble a circuit that uh, does whatever you want to do, namely simulate the code of each party. And you only need witness encryption to intuitively to give the right labels uh, to the other parties so that they could evaluate the garble circuit. So here's the, here it is in a little bit more detail. Let's just assume I.O. for simplicity. Let's assume the original l -round protocol works as follows. You compute the next round message given your input and randomness. You generate the first message. And then to generate the second message, you collect all of the messages that you saw in round number one, and you apply some function next on your input, your randomness, and all of the messages that you saw. And you do this until the end of the protocol. How would you translate this to a two-round protocol? So the, the first naive idea would be to compute the first round message. That, that's easy. You can do it. But then instead of sending the second round message, you, because you, you can't send the second round message because you don't have all of the inputs, which are the first round messages of all of the other parties. So you just output a circuit, an obfuscated circuit. that has your secrets embedded inside. It gets as input all of the second round messages, all of the first round messages from the other parties, and it outputs your second round message. And each party does the same thing for each of the rounds of the protocol. So this is clearly insecure because it's only a one round protocol. So what you actually need is to also have a first round where you first commit on your input. And then you need to make sure that uh, every message is also associated with the proof that things were done correctly. And so namely now this, each circuit will get a collection of proofs. It will verify that these proofs will, were generated honestly, and it will generate the next round message along with the proof for the next circuit to verify. So this is how most of these protocols work. And the question is, how do you implement this obfuscation? And how do you implement the zero knowledge proof? And how do you implement the commitment? Since we are talking about a reusable protocol where the commitment from round one is reusable, you actually want the first round message to contain not a single piece of randomness, but a pair of key from which you can derive as much randomness as you would like when you use it in the second round message. Let's try to understand what's the weakest primitive that we can imagine 
that suffices for a construction of MRNs. We call this primitive a reusable functional OT, and it's basically a label exchange functionality. Imagine two parties, uh, Alice and Bob, where Bob has already sent his message. So it computed based on the public messages, on all of the public information that was sent by now, together with its private input, X2 and K2, where K2 is the fear of seeds, it sends a message B to the sky or to the, as the next message. And now everybody wants to compute the next message of Alice. What Alice will do, Alice will actually compute a garbled circuit that takes as input Bob's uh, message, and it will output the second, the next message that it would have sent given Bob's message. But Alice will not uh, give this circuit in the clear, and it will not use obfuscation, it will just use garbling. And garbling outputs two sets of labels for the inputs. And what we want is actually for Bob to learn the right set of labels corresponding to its input. So if B was uh, the B is zero, we want to learn L zero. If B is one, we want to learn L one. So this is indeed the minimal functionality, the functionality that you need in order to implement uh, the approach that we had with, with garbled circuits. And this is, we call this primitive, as I mentioned, we call it reusable functional OT, which is just a special case of MRNIST for two parties. So here again is what we want. We have two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice's input is, is denoted X1, Bob's in, the private input is denoted X2. And we want to output a bit and another string, L sub B, where G1 is some public function of X1 and it outputs two strings L0 and L1. You can just think of these as labels. And B is a bit which is the output of some public function G2 of X2. So this is what we want. We want to compute uh, an MRNIST for this specific functionality. So this is just a two-party functionality. The idea for the construction is actually very, very simple given previous works. Bob will commit to X2 using a fully homomorphic commitment. So it can first commit on X2. And now anybody can compute publicly a commitment to G2 of X2, namely to the bit B. And what Alice will do, it has two strings, L0 and L1. It will encrypt both of them with a special encryption scheme that can be decrypted by whoever has a proof that the commitment uh, C sub G2 is a commitment to the bit, to the right bit. So if B is, uh, let's say, zero, then whoever has a proof that the commitment is a commitment to zero, for example, has an opening, then this person can also recover L sub zero. Bob knows a, a legal proof that would that will allow him to open L sub B, the right L sub B. But the problem is that a naive proof will just contain, let's say, something like X2, which essentially reveals uh, Bob's input. So Bob will actually need to provide a zero knowledge proof, attesting to the fact that he knows that CG2 is a commitment to the right bit. The way we implement it is that we first we implement the commitments as GSW commitments, and we create this special encryption scheme and proof scheme uh, using ideas from homomorphic commitment literature and the recent two round statistical sender OT of Berkersky and Dotling. In slightly more detail, if you remember, the commitments look like a homomorphic commitment looks like. AR plus uh, XG, where X is the bit that you want to commit to. And the homomorphic commitment looks like A times some new R that's a function of G2, plus something that it looks like one minus B times G. And the, the important point is that whoever has the opening for the original commitment can also compute an opening for the new commitment. And the encryption is going to be very easy. It's generating LWE sample uh, with a secret SB 
and you mask Elsa beta with uh, with Elsa beta with the LW secret. And the zero knowledge proof is going to be just a short uh, basis for a specific lattice. By setting up the parameters uh, correctly, you can show that for the right value of B, Bob can indeed find a short basis for this lattice and therefore recover S sub beta. And if B is not the right value, then the linear noise equation is lossy and therefore uh, most of the information about S sub beta is lost. So this is in a very high level how we build this reusable functional OT from LWE. So let me conclude. What we did is we identified a complete primitive for uh, MRNIST. We called it reusable functional OT. It's somewhat analogous to OT in standard secure computation. We also were able to construct a reusable functional OT from LWE. And we have applications for threshold multi-key FHE. One clear open problem is to build a reusable functional OT from something like DTH. This is uh, still open. Finally, I wanted to mention a new work on ePrint, uh, constructing the first maliciously secure MRNISC. This is joint work with Rex Fernando and Ayush Jain. Uh, please see ePrint if you're interested. Thank you very much for listening.